Well, as Blake said, I'm usually uh, at South Street because I'm the campus par- pastor there at South Street, and I love our South Street uh, church family. But it's a great treat to be out here with you today, Kessinger. I enjoy so much the time of worship. Thank you, Anton and team, for that. Uh, so I want to get started uh, this morning by uh, assuming that we would all pretty much agree that it's the nature of living things to grow. I stole this off our porch. Um, I promise I'll take it back. Uh, but this is a little plant we have, and it's growing. You can tell it's growing because it's growing flowers. But it's the nature of living things to grow. And the most obvious kind of growth to see is physical growth, right? Children grow. Uh, my wife and I have three young grandchildren, and it seems like every time we see them, they've grown a couple of inches. It's not really true, but it seems like that because kids grow. Maybe at your house, you have a, a door frame or a wall that looks a little bit like this. This is actually an old picture from a door frame in our home uh, where we measured the increasing height of our four sons over the years. And the first little number, it's hard to see, but way down at the bottom is like four feet, seven inches. And then the one way at the top is six feet, five inches. Uh, as our tallest son get reached that height, maybe even a little bit more. But we can see children's growth through um, increasing shoe sizes, for example. Uh, these are size 15 uh, that our oldest son wears. I think they might still fit. I'm not sure. Uh, we have bins of shoes we've given away because they no longer fit any of our boys' collective eight feet. You see it. We see growth in clothes that grow increasingly too small. Or we consider uh, nature, for example. How about blue whales? You know, blue whales grow eventually to the the length of 90 feet or so and weigh up to 200 tons. That's 400,000 pounds. Did you know blue whale babies gain 200 pounds a day for seven months? That's almost eight pounds an hour, 24-7 for seven months. Think about that the next time you complain about your grocery bill. And plants grow, of course. Little plants like this one and bamboo. Bamboo is the fastest growing plant on the planet. At its peak growing season, grows 20 inches in 24 hours. You can actually measure its growth in miles per hour. So it's the nature of living things uh, to grow. In fact, when living things are not growing, a lack of growth is a great problem. When children fail to grow, it's called FTT, failure to thrive. And it's a very serious condition because... From plants to animals to human beings, that which is not growing is actually in the process of dying. Uh, We're in the third week now of the Pathway to Purpose series, and it's really all about what it means to grow, what it means to grow as an individual Christian follower of Jesus, and what it means to grow as a community of believers as the church. Last week, Pastor Jeff introduced us to what we call the Discipleship Pathway, Uh, We say often that we want everyone who is a part of Chapel Street to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where you are. Now, if you're newer to Chapel Street, or maybe you're a little uncertain about this whole Jesus thing, uh, let me just say that everything begins with that first phrase, experience grace. We're glad you're here. We hope maybe that you'll come and join us for one of John Dixon's sessions called The Doubter's Guide to Jesus. But everything begins with that phrase, experience grace. And that just means to understand and believe the gospel. That is the good news that through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be spiritually reborn into a new life with a new heart and a new identity and a new purpose and a new eternal destiny. And as Pastor Jeff said last week, to be able to say with Mary Magdalene's character in The Chosen, I was one way, now I'm completely different, And in between, there was him. For those of you who have experienced grace, who have put your faith in Jesus, we want you to see that next phrase, grow in faith. And we think the best way to to do this, to experience that kind of growth, is through what we call the six G's. That is gather, gospel, grow, groups, go, and give. These are the building blocks of the Christian life. In fact, the building blocks of the church. And we're encouraging everyone who calls Chapel Street their church home to be asking a question this fall. Ask yourself, am I a, am I a 6G follower of Jesus? Are all these part of my life, my walk with Christ? Or am I maybe a 2 or 3G follower? We want each one of us to be able to grow. How does God want us to grow? What would you like to add to my life? Not just to make me busier or to ask more of me, but to give me, to give us more of himself. Last week, Jeff brought up the first two G's, which were gather 
and gospel. We are gathered people and we are a proclaiming people. Today we want to talk about grow and groups. Now most of you have heard about our Rooted group program. Our next session of Rooted begins I think in January. But we're also launching something we call life groups. And in the back of your chair there's a little uh, QR code. If you want more information about how to become part of a life group or what they're even all about, just use your phone, get that QR code, and we would love to help you get connected to a life group. So I want to begin this morning with a passage out of 2 Peter in the New Testament, just the first eight verses. So look on the screens or follow your Bible as I read. Peter writes, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through our knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about experiencing grace here, the transforming power of the gospel, and then he goes on a little bit further and starts about the impact of this grace in our lives. Verse three, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And now he shifts to talking about growing in faith. Verse five, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and the goodness knowledge, and the knowledge self-control, and the self-control perseverance, and the perseverance godliness, and the godliness mutual affection, and the mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanna focus on just two things this morning. God wants us to grow, and we grow best together. First, God wants us to grow. Years ago, I saw a story about a young man who dreamed his whole life about becoming a Marine. Now, I tried to look up the details of this story uh, on the internet, and I couldn't find it exactly. So this could be an apocryphal story, but it, it makes a point. At the time, the story, as the story went, as I remember it, the Marine Corps had a height requirement, a minimum height requirement. It was something like five foot feet, six inches. You had to be at least five feet, six inches tall to become a Marine. And this young man knew he was very close to that cutoff uh, height but he wanted to apply anyway because he really wanted to be a Marine. So he went to the recruiting office, took all the tests, and passed everything with flying colors, was a perfect candidate for the Marines, except he measured out at five feet, five and three quarters. He was one quarter inch too short to become a U.S. Marine. He was crestfallen. And on the way home, um, feeling terrible, he got an idea. So he got home, went to his garage, and found a two by four. And he proceeded to whack himself over the head with his two by four until he raised a significant bump on his head. And he drove back to the recruiting station, replied again, and made the height requirement and passed. Now I don't really know if that's a true story, and I don't really know how smart that is. But that's the guy I want defending my country, right? I want that guy. A Couple things about growth. First, growth requires effort. Peter writes, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith now, I want you to see, this is a very interesting phrase Peter uses. Now, he's not saying we need to add something to our faith in order to receive the love and grace of Christ, to be able to receive the salvation offered to us through his grace. No, we are saved by faith alone in what Jesus has already done. But what he is saying is that everything begins with faith, and then God invites us to grow in living out that faith, and that happens through effort, he says. The phrase, make every effort to add, is just two words in the New Testament Greek. Spude, which means zealous diligence, and epikorageo, which means to supply or add everything needed. So make every effort to add to your faith. Now, we know much of physical growth is kind of effortless. That is, some kinds of growth just happen naturally. Children don't have to try to grow. They just do. They're created that way. Other kinds of growth require great effort or discipline. 
Have you heard of a guy named Tom Amberry? My guess is no. But Tom Amberry was a retired podiatrist that died in 2017 at the age of 94. But in 1993, when he was 71 years old, he set the Guinness Book of World Records for shooting free throws. Okay. He had played basketball in college way back in the 1940s, and when he retired, he made shooting free throws his hobby. He started shooting at least 500 free throws every day, six days a week, and on November 15, 1993, he set the world record by making, get this, 2,750 free throws in a row. He didn't miss for something like eight hours. Now, if you know something about me, you know I know a little something about shooting a basketball. Spent years and years of my early life learning to do it, studying it, practicing it. And at one point in my life, when I was about 20, uh, in practice one day, I made 191 in a row myself. And I thought that was really, really cool until I heard of a guy named Tom Amberry, right? So I know a little something what it takes for a 71-year-old man to be able to do that. You have to know the fundamentals. You have to know how to get a, a solid balanced stance. You have to know what the form is that you can repeat over and over again. You have to have a good follow through. You have to do them over and over and over again so the ball goes straight and goes right through the hoop. And he did all those things at age 71. And that reminds me a little bit of our six Gs. We have to know the fundamentals and we have to practice them and rehearse them over and over again because it takes effort to grow. Gather, gospel, grow, groups, go, and give. Little footnote on Tom Amberry. Just three years after he did that, some guy named Ted St. Martin broke his record by making over 5,000 in a row. 5,221 to be exact. But what about spiritual growth? What are the marks on the wall for spiritual growth? Peter, in his letter, describes these marks this way. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And the goodness, knowledge. That's God's word. And the knowledge, self-control. And the self-control, perseverance. And the perseverance, godliness. And the godliness, mutual affection. And the mutual affection, love. So how does this growth take place? Back to our model. We think it takes place through these six G's. Gospel, gather, groups, grow, go, and give. Secondly, Peter says, this growth then produces good fruit. Like many of you, I suspect, I want my lawn to look nice. I, I Wanted to grow green, you know, and lush. The rain is good for it. I love how it looks right after I mow. You know, some of you may identify with that, the nice stripes, diagonal stripes, crisscross stripes, and it looks beautiful. I imagine myself to be, to be Adam, you know, ob ob obeying God's command to subdue the earth. It's my little dominion, right? But I have a spot in my yard where grass never grows, and it drives me crazy. It's right next to our driveway, and I've tried everything multiple times, multiple years, multiple seasons. I rake it, and I plant it, and I fertilize, and I water like crazy, but grass will not grow there. I think it was a nuclear dump at some point. I'm not sure. <laughs> There's something in the soil that resists growth, and that spot is unproductive. Peter says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, if you are growing in all these ways, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive, meaning idle or unfruitful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Peter is saying a hard thing here. Uh, to me, this is a, a convicting thing he's saying. And here's what it is. He's saying, I think, it's possible to know who Jesus is, to believe in him and what he's done, to call yourself a Christian, and yet to be ineffective and unproductive in your faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think it can mean being something like I would call a, you know, a Sunday Christian. Maybe we all fall in this category from time to time. That's going to church on Sunday, singing new songs, listening to a sermon. But Monday through Saturday, kind of living like we never really have been to church before. 
or you really couldn't tell. But I think most often it might mean something like this, to become more of an observer of the church, a consumer of the church, but not a contributing participant in the church. And if you think about it, it's totally understandable. Our whole culture teaches us to be consumers and observers. Uh, we get our groceries at Aldi, and if they don't have what we want, we go to Jewel, and if they don't have what we want, we go to Costco. We're consumers. We watch football games on TV, but very few of us actually play football. Someone described a football game once as 50,000 people desperately needed exercise of watching 22 men desperately need of rest, right? <laughs> And so it's easy for us to see the church the same way. But look at what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. Notice, as each part does its work. That's God's vision his plan for his church, that we will grow together so that we can reflect the life of Jesus in the world and that each part will do its work. That's us, each and every one of us. God wants us to grow so that we will be effective and productive in our faith. Secondly, we grow best together. We grow best together. Many years ago during my youth pastor days, I used to take high school students on what we called the Colorado bike trip. We would take 40 or 50 students or so, all our bikes in a truck, bus out to Colorado and spend a week riding, mountains through the, riding bikes through the mountains. This is a photo of a group we had um, in the early 90s on top of Independence Pass, about 12,000 feet above sea level. We'd cover an average of like 40, 50 miles a day, including several mountain passes. We would always ride in groups of riders, five or six deep. And we did that for several reasons. First of all, the groups provided safety. It was much easier for drivers of cars to see a group of bicyclists rather than one uh, person on a bicycle. It also provided a ways for us to communicate with each other constantly. Groups provided greater strength and endurance. And usually in the month leading up to the trip, I would go out of my bike by myself and try to ride 10 or 12 miles to get in some kind of shape. And I was always surprised when on the first day of the actual trip, how much further I could ride and how much faster I could ride when I was riding with a group. And that's because when you ride in a group, you can kind of draft on the person who's riding in front of you. If you've ever done that, it's amazing. They cut the air and you can ride behind them and you, you can ride further and faster, sometimes barely even having to pedal because they're just pulling you along. Riding in groups also provided the kind of fellowship. That is the fellowship of both shared suffering and shared joy. You shared the exhaustion of riding up the mountain and you shared the joy and the exhilaration of being at the top of the mountain. Here's the point. We are stronger together than we are alone. In his beautiful little book called Life Together, German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed by the Nazis in 1945, writes, let him who cannot be alone beware of community. Alone you stood before God when he called you. Alone you had to answer that call. But the reverse is also true. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. Into the community you were called. In the community of the called, you bear your cross, you struggle, you pray, you are not alone. He's saying that each one of us stands before Jesus alone. That faith is a deeply personal experience of grace. You're not a Christian here today because your grandfather was a preacher. You're not a Christian here today because you come to church now and then. You become a Christian when you stand alone in front of Jesus and ex encounter, experience his grace in a transforming way. That you do alone. But Bonhoeffer is also saying that we do not live out this life of faith alone. We live it together. In Romans chapter one, Paul is writing to some uh, fellow believers in Rome, a place where he's never visited before, people he doesn't know. And he writes, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Secondly, we grow better together because we are encouraged by others. Last week, Jeff talked about this, but we all remember very well the weird time we just now call 
COVID, right? We remember the masks. If you're like me, you find them in weird places and you find them in your dashboard, your back of your pockets, your coat pocket. We remember the mask. We remember the social distancing. We remember the, the shelter in place orders. The COVID pandemic in many ways robbed us of almost two full years of normal life. And there were so many losses during that time. You know, some lost jobs, some lost income, some lost loved ones. Children lost a whole year or more of school. We lost the freedom to gather with family and friends. And we here, the gathered people of God, lost the freedom to gather together for worship. Last week, Jeff talked about what it was like to try to preach looking at that blinking light in the back on the camera. All of us who preached struggled with that. We love to preach, but that's not how it's supposed to be. And in this loss, I think COVID may have taught us a few things. Taught us to appreciate something we so easily take for granted. Something we only fully appreciate once it's taken away. And that is the joy and privilege of gathering. The joy and privilege of being mutually encouraged. If we look again at the description of the early church in Acts chapter 2. We've seen this passage for now three weeks in a row. We read it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. To the breaking of bread and the prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. Notice the highlighted words. The church, quite literally, is built on that word together, which is why the months of the COVID shutdown were so painful and difficult. First, because our identity as a gathered people was made impossible. Of course, we could still be individual believers, but we couldn't gather as God's people. And when we're not gathered in large groups or in small groups, there is no mutual encouragement. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Finally, we grow best together because we are challenged by others. We're challenged. In Hebrews chapter 10, we read, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. The word translated there in English as spur uh, is a word that means to stir up, to provoke, um, to motivate. If you ever watch sports, and sorry for all the sports stuff today, I've watched sports a time or two. Uh, One of the things you'll see if you pay attention, it's kind of dangerous to do this because it involves lip reading. And when you lip read professional sports, be careful. But so when, a, when a player or an athlete makes a, makes a great play, does something really important, and the camera zooms in on that player, they will often, very often, be screaming one two-word phrase to all their teammates. You know what it is? Let's go! Right? Let's go! Say, say you're watching a Cubs game and a guy hits a home run to tie or to win the game. As he's rounding third base, he's like, let's go. If you're watching a WNBA game and somebody hits a game-winning three-pointer, she'll scream out, let's go. If by some miracle today, a Bears player scores a touchdown, <laughs> we will all collectively yell, oh, come on, let's go, right? And they'll be yelling that because they're excited But more than that, they're saying to their teammates, let's do this together. Let's go. Let's finish what we came here to do. Let's win this game. That's what it means to spur one another on. Let's go. Last week, Blake referred to this at our annual meeting. And uh, the chair of our executive council, Rusty Bland, began the whole meeting by sharing some of what he's seen and sees God doing in and through all of us here at Chapel Street. The growth of new believers, the number of baptisms, our collective generosity, our growing ministries from Shepherd's Heart to Buddy Break to VBS to high school to middle school to women's and men's ministries, adding a third service here at Kessinger Campus. And then he summarized what he thinks God is saying to us through all this growth. What's he saying to us as a church family? This is what Rusty said. He said, it's go time. It's go time. 
That's what it means to spur one another on. God is doing something in us and through us, so let's go. Let's go. Let's join him and let's together get about the mission he's called us to accomplish. Let's go. Many of you knew, uh, know I grew up in the church. Uh, Dad was a pastor. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was eight years old. I was baptized when I was 12. And in the first 18 years of my life, I could literally count on one hand the number of Sundays I was not in church. I had like seven straight years of perfect Sunday school attendance, 52 weeks a year. But when I graduated high school, went to college, I stopped going to church. Maybe you can relate to that. And there are lots of reasons. Some of them legitimate, some of them probably kind of lame. Um, it was hard to find a church that was like the one I grew up in. None of my college friends went to church that I knew of. It was hard to find a ride early on a Sunday morning. And possibly I was a bit lazy. But one thing I did do, the fall of my freshman year, I went to a campus Christian fellowship meeting and I signed up for a small group prayer cell. I had no idea what it was really. I just signed up for it. I was placed into a small group of other Christian students, a couple of guys, a couple of girls, people I'd never met before, but I went. And for most of my four years of college, I joined that little prayer cell every Thursday night for an hour at 9 p.m. in a dorm room. Like I said, I didn't really know the other students at all. I didn't hang out with them during my college life. But we had two things in common. We'd each put our faith in Jesus, and we shared the encouragement of prayer. Whatever else was going on in my life, I knew that for that one hour on Thursday nights, I would be with those brothers and sisters in Christ and I knew they would be willing to pray for me and I for them. And looking back, I believe it was that single thread, that single thread, a Thursday night prayer cell meeting for an hour with people I barely knew that held my faith together during my college years. This is why most of our ministries break down into small groups. Men's ministry has team groups. Women's ministry has Bible study groups or groups for moms. Student ministries have D groups. And we're launching life groups because we grow best together. Because we are strengthened, encouraged, and challenged when we are together. Because something, when something goes sideways in our lives. I got an email early this morning that a South Street church member passed away this morning at 1 a.m. I'm gonna to talk to his widow later today. When something goes sideways, when the hard stuff happens, we all need brothers and sisters in Christ who will pray with us and for us. It's the nature of living things to grow. And so if you put your faith in Christ, he's given you new life, and now he wants you to grow. And we grow best together. So, let's go. That was me as we close. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for your grace that changes forever who we are. Thank you for loving this, your church, for building us together into a people of eternal significance in your eyes. And now teach us by your word and your spirit to grow, to grow up to maturity, that together we would be effective and productive in our faith. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Our benediction this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 4. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and in all things may we grow up together into him. Amen.